Good morning, my Watford friends. Thank you so much for all your kindness to me and Penny while we've been having COVID. I'm sorry I can't be with you today, but I'm really grateful for the messages and the offers of help. Uh, the suggestions, some of them sensible, like uh, to get rest and make sure you hydrate well. Some of them are not so sure about the sensible nature. Uh, Bill, uh, your suggestion that I should drink lots of whiskey. Not sure what that's got to do with getting over COVID. Uh, but there again, it hasn't done you any harm, has it? And considering that you are 164 years old, um, maybe I should take up whiskey drinking. I've also just realized something else. Uh, offering insults to Bill on uh, a recording means there's no comeback to me. <laughs> Gives me some ideas. Anyway, we are here not to talk about that, but to talk about Haggai. Last week, we looked at Haggai chapter one and the challenges to our assumptions as to God's timing, making God our priority, seeking to bring him pleasure and honor, chapter one, verse eight, uh, being sober about the circumstances of our lives that where God might be trying to get our attention, the reassurance of God when we do act in faith that he is with us, and enjoying a restored relationship with God because the people feared the Lord. So the work is now going. The temple is now being rebuilt. There's a gap of time, and now we come to chapter 2. And the first thing we're going to talk about is the call to reflect. The call to reflect. So Haggai speaks to Zerubbabel, to Joshua, to the remnant of the people, and we notice that all parts of the community are addressed. Secular leadership, spiritual leadership, the remnant of the people, everybody's involved, and no group will achieve much for God unless all parts are determined to please God and bring him honor. And that's a call for all of us that are listening to this today in the building uh, where we meet together. When we come together, the one thing that's more important than anything else is that we have a loyalty to God that we desire to bring him pleasure and honor and that we will all play our part. You might think your part is small, but it is not. Uh, uh, everybody's part is important. Chris's part is as important as Peter's. Uh, Garth's part is just as important uh, as, as Danny's. Charles' part is just as important as Sarah's. Uh, uh, Desmond's part is just as important as Cherry's, and so on. We could go through everybody here. Different roles, everybody important. All, all of us need to be aligned in the same way to honor and please God by using our gifts, energy, time, resources, whatever we have, to build for God. Let's call each other to play our part. Then Haggai offers some questions to his hearers. Who of you saw the house in its former glory? How does it look now? Doesn't it seem like, frankly, nothing? Now we're in 520 BC. The former temple was destroyed in 586 BC, 66 years ago. Some of them were old enough to remember what it was like. And it may have been discouraging to them. The former temple was glorious. It was Solomon's temple. It was one of the wonders of the world. This pile of rubble that's now slowly being rebuilt, it's going to be smaller. It's not going to look as good. It won't be Solomon's temple. Perhaps they were discouraged looking at the past and then the current situation and envisaging a future for the temple that didn't look as glorious as the past. Perhaps also the work had begun to lose momentum, and as the scale of the task became clearer, and that possibility grew that the new temple may not be as glorious as the old one, I wonder if they were losing heart. You and I can be similarly affected. Depending on our view of the past, the current state of the church, and our vision for the future, as we work for God, and sometimes it is laborious and tiring and the rewards don't come very quickly, we can get a little disillusioned. Is it worth it? All this teaching in children's ministry, all these Sundays I turn up and sing or, or serve or, or the, the things I do behind the scenes, uh, the people I visit and the people I pray for, is it really worth it? Those little offers of help, is it really worth it? Well, if we're comparing the present with the past, un, it can be unhelpful because the present is not meant to be a rep repetition of the past. God isn't asking them to build the same temple. He's asking them to build him He's asking, sorry, them in their context and time to build him, God, now, a temple now for God's people now, for him now. He's not saying you have to reproduce the glory of the past. I think it's important for us in the Watford Church of Christ and the West Watford Free Church not to compare the present with the past in the sense of trying to replicate it, but to think about whether what we're doing now is bringing God glory and whether we have a vision for God's glory in the future to be even greater than the past through what he will do 
through his spirit, through us, that will be unique, different from the past, maybe connected to it, but different and glorious in a new way. And we're going to talk more about that in a minute. But the glory doesn't have to be the same as the past. What we do now must glorify God. We don't have to go back to the past. We need to go forward with hope. And I think that's the big question here is how hopeful and faithful, you could say, are we about the future of the church? And can we be honest if there's doubt and discouragement in our hearts? Um, it's not a sin to be discouraged. It's important to be honest about it. Bear in mind, God can handle whatever you are feeling. After the call to reflect, then, we have the call to courage, where Haggai says, be strong. Be strong all uh, to Zerubbabel, to Joshua, and be strong all the people of the land. Uh, and work, by the way, for I am with you. He says, but now, now make a decision. I, I don't often do this, but I would say this. Any of us today, no matter how doubtful, fearful, disillusioned you may feel today, you can make a decision now. You can make a decision now to be strong. Strong in the Lord's strength, not your own strength. And being strong doesn't solve everything. But you can choose that because the command here is, but now, but now be strong. Not next week, next, not after you've had six more prayer times, but now be strong because I am with you, God says. So it's a statement of faith. It's a request or command of faith. It doesn't matter what the past was like or how we feel about it or what we think it all signifies. What matters is what decision we make here and now confronted with the word of God. The be strong command reminds me of Joshua chapter one, when Joshua was going into the promised land and he said, he's told, be strong and courageous. He didn't feel it, I think. Otherwise, why why tell him? But here we have be strong three times for Zerubbabel, for Joshua, for all the people of the land. Clearly, there needs to be an emphasis because they're feeling the challenge and all parts of the community need to make that same decision. Strength in that sense is a decision. Uh, it's not the feeling of strength. It's the decision that I will be strong by God's grace. And it also implies that they knew what it would look like to be strong in their context. So if God was to say to you, be strong, what would that mean to you? How would that look? What would it mean to take up that, take to heart that challenge from God to, but now be strong? And then he says, work for I am with you. So that's, a, that's the wonderful thing about this. It's not us on our own. Uh, he says, I, uh, this is what I covenanted with you. Uh, my spirit remains among you. Do not fear. There's no need to fear because God's spirit is with us. He remains or abides. In other words, you might have thought I'd abandoned you, but I am still with you despite your rebellion and apparent the realities of your challenges. Do not fear. Whatever they're fearing, maybe the king will reverse his decision to, to allow them back to the land. Uh, perhaps they will, they fear standing out by finishing the temple because they're still a minority in the land. Perhaps they're fearing the compromise of their personal comfort. Perhaps they fear they will run out of resources. And let's face it, we're all a bit worried about resources right now, whether it's gas, electricity, money to pay the mortgage. Uh, there's a lot of challenges in this, and uh, we've got to be honest about that and realistic about the fact those challenges exist. But getting petrified in fear about them and then fear and then failing to have faith and trust in God to have, be strong in him and work for him doesn't solve those problems. It only magnifies them and, pet, and, and paralyzes us and, and gets us focused on the things that we can't control. So there's a lot of fears here. Uh, we don't have to fear uh, because God is indeed with us. And then the final call here after the, the first two, the call to reflect and the call to strength and courage is the call to trust. In verse 6, he says, I'm going to shake the heavens and the earth, the sea and the dry land. I'm going to shake the nations. Uh, I'm going to fill this house with glory. The silver is mine, the gold is mine. The glory, a key verse for the whole book. Verse 9, the glory of this present house, the new one that's not yet finished building, will be greater than the glory of the former house, the world-renowned Solomon's Temple. It says the Lord Almighty, and in this place I will grant peace, peace, peace. It's a relationship here that God is dealing with. Humans He's not just about building a temple. It's something wonderful that's coming. Uh, there's a messianic element here. I think the desire of the nations will come to fill this house, the treasure of the Gentiles, the inclusion of the Gentiles that we see in the new covenant in our time. Uh, God is saying that he'll rearrange the old order of things. 
And ultimately, of course, when Jesus comes and enters the temple as the living temple, he cleanses the temple, brings the living water and the powerful truth of God that will change the world. That's what's coming. And that's why ultimately the, the glory of the temple in the future is going to be greater than the glory of the temple in the past because Jesus was not in that temple, but Jesus is now present as the temple, bringing God's relationship with humankind to every single human being. So we don't need a physical temple anymore. We have a spiritual temple. It's a wonderful promise, a tremendous vision. God's saying that the future is greater than the past. He defines what is greater. The, the future may not be as wealthy as the past. The future may not be as big as the past, but the future will be greater because God will ensure that in his way of what great really means. And he will grant peace. Why does he mention peace here now at the end of this uh, section? Uh, could it be that the fear of reprisals has frightened the people? Maybe they're also afraid that their delays in rebuilding the temple have angered God. They know how God dealt with the desert rebellions and the idolatry of Israel's past. Are they worried he won't forgive them? But the promise of peace here stands because God has faith in his people, sometimes perhaps when they don't even have faith in themselves. And I think that's a wonderful, a good and beautiful thing about God. He believes in you more than you do. He believes in you more than any other person has. Perhaps you had a parent or a teacher or a coach who believed in you more than you did and believed in you and said, you can do this and you can do that and you can achieve this and you can achieve that and you can overcome this. And we value those people. I've had people like that in my life. I still do. I'm grateful. But there are some times when, when even with all that human encouragement, there's just some things you think, no, sorry, I appreciate your desire to help me to believe here, but no. But yet God has ultimate belief in us. He trusts you and me to build his church. I mean, who are we? But he trusts you and me to be adequate in Watford, in West Watford, to do what he wants us to do. And wherever we live, in Aylesbury and Chesham and Chorley Wood and, and wherever, he believes in you. He doesn't just believe in it. He doesn't believe in an institution. He believes in you. He believes in his family his body, the church. And that's what's going on here. He says, I'm going to give you peace. It's going to work out. Something greater is coming than has ever been seen before. And it's coming through you, Zerubbabel and Joshua and the remnant of the people. You people who did nothing for 15 years, uh-huh, right. It's you I've chosen. And you are adequate. And my strength is going to be in you if you choose it. And my spirit is with you. My promises have not failed. I'm not abandoning you. I believe in you. And I hope if nothing else comes across today, that you'll take that to heart. There is a time to reflect. There's a time to decide to have courage. There's a time to decide to trust God and take on his vision. God always has a vision. And so we're going to finish today by listening to a song that I came across on my personal spiritual retreat, I downloaded an album from one of my favorite groups called Point of Grace, and this song really stuck with me. And so I've put it at the end of the sermon with the lyrics so you can listen to it. And it's a song called I Believe, or sorry, He Believes in You, as in God Believes in Us. Let's listen to this together, and then I'll let Dan take over from that point. Thanks again for listening and praying for me and Penny. I hope to be with you again really soon. Take care of yourselves. And I hope you enjoy the song and the message of this song. And really listen to it as God speaking to you. Mm -hmm.